Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. And my guest today is Adam Juddelson. Hello, Adam. Hello. He's an entrepreneur and startup advisor and the founder and CEO of First Principles Catalyst. And we're talking today, very interested about this. We we're talking before the show here, because uh, this is very real to uh, uh, some of my projects today, but transforming services into a product-led company. So services-based companies making that transition into product-led companies. And I know that's, you've got a number of clients that are in that space, but why don't you give us more of your background, more of your bio? Yeah, sure. So I'm a Silicon Valley native. I went to school on the East Coast. I did international affairs. I started my career in national security work really trying to understand what our enemies were thinking, how we would balance power against them, how we would make sure we were strategically powerful in those types of situations. And at some point I got the bug to do startup work. I was lucky to be an early employee at Palantir Technologies. Uh, for folks who don't know Palantir, it was one of the first uh, multi-billion dollar companies that focused on data and analysis and really just solving hard problems for businesses, uh, but as a product company. And you know, after that, I spent a number of years at different startups, both as a founder, as an operator, frequently running product, um, and some other disciplines as well. And I've just had been really lucky and fortunate to focus on a lot of different products in a lot of different emerging technology industries over my career. And that's what I do now. So now my company focuses explicitly on helping emerging technology companies through product coaching and through fractional hands-on product engagements. So we go find awesome people that have exactly the type of experience and expertise that's needed to help a particular company move the needle on their challenge. And you know those challenges range pretty dramatically, right? If you're a yeah. public company, it could be uh, you know trying to corral the troops and get everybody behind the same vision. If you're a small company, it could be hunting for product market fit, and they're just completely different product skills. Yeah. And so what we've learned is that you have to have a really tailored approach for that to have the right person either helping you behind the scenes as a coach or helping you in a hands-on capacity in the trenches. Can I ask, what, what was your undergrad? I mean, what were your degrees in to, to make yeah, the transition yeah. from that <laughs> side? Because I, my college roommate was a double major poli-sci Russian and he mm -hmm. went that path. And then he ended up like four years later in tech for the, his entire career and, and kind of leveraged that, like that knowledge, that experience uh, into his management role and did very well. Yeah, if you, I think it's it's worth a slightly longer answer to this one because uh, it really starts in high school where I had been lucky to participate in the International Science and Engineering Fair and also the Silicon Valley Science and Engineering Fair and I honestly never really thought of myself as an engineer or a scientist but I was but I had a teacher that pushed me to be involved in these and we ended up winning the Silicon Valley Science and Engineering wow. Fair yeah. and then placing fourth at, at the International Science and Engineering Fair. And that kind of got me thinking, like, maybe I should be an engineer. Um, and I actually enrolled to go to college to be a chemical engineer, which was what our project had been in was chemical engineering. And then at the last second I went and visited, it was, it, for me, it was down between Georgetown and Brown. Brown as a chemical engineer and Georgetown as a part of the School of Foreign Service. And when I went to the campuses and visited, I just was not at all excited by the level of ambition in the people that I met at Brown. And I was extremely excited by the level of ambition that I met in the people at Georgetown. Yeah. But then I got there and a year in, I had this identity crisis because there was no science, there was no engineering. Yeah. And so I went to my advisor and I told him like, I'm making my own major. I'm adding science and engineering to it. You have to accept it. And he just started laughing. And I was like, what are you laughing about? And he was like, well, we already have it. It's just very small. You probably just haven't heard of it. And so my degree is in science, technology, and international affairs. And every year, Georgetown graduates 30 or 40 people from this crazy degree where most people in the School of Foreign Service hate science and technology and like yeah. really want to keep their math and science classes in the rearview mirror. And then there's like 30 or 40 of us that actually embrace that stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I still got to take genetics, microbiology, multivariable calculus, uh, some material science, like a lot of different things that you would not actually take in a traditional foreign service degree, but with a focus on international affairs. And then I did a master's in technology and national security. And really what I focused on at the time, which sounds kind of funny in the rearview mirror, was I focused on weapons of mass destruction, which at the time was uh, a hot topic that required understanding some of the science and engineering, but also deeply understanding the geopolitical balance of power. Yeah. I, it, you know, I know this is a completely different topic of what we're, we're going to talk about. I, I do always find it fascinating to see the career shifts of, uh, you know, so many people that are leaders in technology areas that come from very different backgrounds. Like one of my guy who's a, a CTO, a, a VP of engineering, got his degree in music composition, um, but he had a, a brain for music and math and that, that side of it. My brother-in-law, who is 25 years at Microsoft, is an engineering whiz, um, but is also a very talented multi-instrument you know, person. Again, just his brain built that way. I've got two kids that both did science degrees and my daughter went and did her master's at public health administration and both are now in data science. They just got that gravitated towards that and I don't know, it was prodding on my side with my daughter, my oldest, just because I kept saying, it's like, you're in over in that more of the old hospital system, that that side of the public sector. I said, you know, you can double your salary by moving over to the private <laughs> sector. But, uh, yeah. but anyway, uh, yeah, I, it's it's just fascinating uh, to, to go and kind of look at that path in why, why I asked. But I, I do, this, this idea of, you know, working with advising companies on, uh, you know, providing advisory services. And maybe, maybe you could share some of your background, like how you got into that space. And then we can kind of get into the main topic of, you know, moving companies over to product led. So sure, advisory sure. services, how did you kind of find your way into that specific? Yeah, category? I mean, by accident, I left a startup where it just didn't feel like things were going to materialize. And that was on a Friday. And on a Monday, one of the investors who had heard me pitch to help raise the A round for that startup, uh, basically said, you're available. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm available, but like, I might write a book or I might do all these other things. I had all these like grand visions at that time. And uh, on that Monday, he said, let me introduce you to another founder who I think could use your help. And he introduced me and I had no idea what I was doing from an advisory perspective. And so, you know, the, the founder seemed like a nice person. He needed assistance. And he, he described the problem, I thought, in a really apt way. This is not the, the standard uh, thing that we hear, but we hear this from time to time. And he basically said, look, I've got this startup. I've raised all this money. I've got this you know quarter million dollar a month burn going on here for my engineering team. And I've got this Ferrari. It's like a really nice team that knows what they're doing. Uh, but I have no idea how to drive the Ferrari. I don't know where I'm supposed to drive the Ferrari to. I don't know how I'm supposed to take the corners. Like he actually came up with this analogy. And I remember thinking to myself, oh yeah, like that I've got locked up. I can help with that. And so he said, you know, what do you, what do you propose? And I was like, well, why don't we do an assessment? And based on the assessment, you can decide if you, you know, want to bring me in to, to help you with this stuff. And we did the assessment. I thought he was really interesting. I thought the problems were really, really interesting. Spent like a week talking to everybody, assessing it, wrote up a nice report. And at the end of it, he was like, great, you know, can you help us implement this stuff? And of course, I didn't know, you know, what was coming, right? And, uh, you know, and I was offered, you know, more money to do halftime work than I had previously been making doing full-time work. And I was like, this is kind of interesting. And no one founder owns my destiny and I still get to help and I can still be in the weeds and learn cool stuff. And so that's really how I got the bug. And like a few weeks later, I got the second client um, again without trying, which was like really cool, right? You know, most people spend uh, the first bit just trying to like hustle and find the clients. And they were just kind of falling into my lap because people, people had heard that I was available and was maybe doing something a little bit different. And so that's kind of how I built it out was really just by, by accident the first time. Um, and, uh, and that's how I started to get into it. And then of course, you know, later on, I started to figure out, okay, what are the actual offerings? What is it that we actually do? How does this scale beyond just me? All of those big questions come up, but for the first, for the first six or 12 months, you know, it was really very much focused on me just looking at startups that were doing cool things and trying to figure out how can I, how can I help these guys get through this, this key phase? Yeah. 
How, how, so what are the key differences between a service-based company and a product-led company? Because in my, my experience, I also provide advisory services and more on the marketing side, fractional CMO services, but a lot of services, uh, you know, some uh, you know, VC-backed companies as well. Uh, it, the majority of them are product-based companies, not services side. It's really difficult to raise funds, external funds for a service-based business because oh, yeah. gen generally your your valuation your is 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 a one to one or less than that of mm -hmm. of your contracts of your customers that are out there there's yeah. nothing to continually grow that so i mean what are the what besides that aspect of the fundraising aspect of it what are the key differences between the two types yeah of yeah it's it's so funny because like for me coming out of venture-backed startups it's always been very obvious um, but when I go into service companies and assist them in building some of their first products, which is one of the things that does come up from time to time for us um, and came up in a first class way when I did it for Deloitte for a couple of years, is that uh, like the key, the, it sounds so simple, but the key thing that you have to get your head wrapped around if you are a service company that wants to build products is that you are going, and let's, let's assume digital products for a second, you are going to use the same exact code for N customers. N being defined as some large number, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that this is where it usually breaks down is just in that simple definition. Because you have service companies saying, oh, well, we did a project that was on utility efficiency, blah, blah, blah. And this other customer has a problem where they're also working on utility efficiency. And so we'll take the code that we have over here and we'll kind of adapt it over there. Boom, we're a product company. And like false, patently false, not true. I remember, I remember when I was at Deloitte, there was this term that got used a lot that just, it just made me like, as a product person, want to like vomit in my mouth. And it was lift and shift. And they would say, oh, we're just going to take the code we wrote over here and we're going to lift it and we're going to shift it and we're going to put it into this other client environment. Yep. And I remember struggling to try to explain to people why this was so asinine. And the analogy that I came up with uh, which hopefully you like, is I, I would start to say to people, okay, imagine that you have built a city, Tokyo. Okay, you've built Tokyo. And then you say, well, New York is also a city, so it should be pretty similar to Tokyo. So we'll just grab all of the plumbing, all the electrical, all the roads, all the bridges. We'll just lift those and we'll just magically put them in New York. And I think when you conceptualize it that way, you start to realize, well, first of all, how are we going to even get all that stuff over there? Right. <laughs> Second of all, there's no way that any of those things are going to match up and like, okay, maybe somewhere there will be a functioning bridge from like, you know, this point to this point within a particular park, but like all of the surrounding won't actually work. Yeah. And so that's, that's the key thing is you've got to have one code base that is solving the same exact problem over and over and over again for multiple customers. And I think that's where most service businesses go wrong is they're like, oh yeah, of course our customers are all the same because they all hire us for marketing or they all hire us for energy projects or they all hire us for you know what have you. There's a service company that does just about everything under the sun. So that's where I would start is to just ask like, do they actually have the exact same problem and out of the entire solution that you've been building for years, which pieces of that solution are actually the abstractable pieces that are common across these problems? You know, it, it's, it's funny because I had this exact experience having worked at a couple venture-backed startups in the Bay Area, moving up to the Seattle area, went to work for Microsoft at the beginning of what is now Office 365, and they had the exact same problem. They did it internally. So it was, in fact, the team I joined a year after, they were spun out of internal Microsoft IT to create this. And the problem they have, and for folks that don't know some of the background that are uh, around uh, Office 365, now Microsoft 365, is that they struggled to make that transition. That where uh, the original version of it, which MMS became BPOS, um, for those that know the lingo, um, where every single one of those clients was a custom build. It wasn't a product. They were going in and essentially Microsoft acting as their IT team to go build that out. Now, since then, and, and learned that lesson and the difficulties of that, uh, working with some smaller companies that did the same thing, that were consulting companies, 
built something for a couple of customers, found a pattern, a repeatable pattern. So all good. That's the indicator. Like, hey, there's an opportunity here. But they, when you go and look at their actual offering and realize that there's no way to drop it in the lap of a partner to do that. Like we provide these bits, the, the partner goes and does it or the customer does it. Like it's not, not a product. It's a, it's the, it, it, that's where they, a lot of them fall down is to, make well, some got a, decisions about where they how they scope the this thing to get it to an, an actual repeatable product yeah i think and i think you're hitting on the second piece which i should add to the definition which is that it has to have users right and i think that that is also something that sounds so obvious to product people but does not sound obvious coming out of a service world because in a service world you could have a five million ten million even a hundred million dollar contract where literally there's no one from the customer that quote unquote logs in to use the thing because it could be your team that's doing the work with some sort of technology empowered solution. And there's lots of code, make no mistake, there is lots of code in solution work for services and there is lots of code in product work for products. It's just very different code, right? And so that's another hallmark of you have a services problem is where are your users? So one of the first questions I ask when I get a when I get a venture backed company that has fallen into the services pattern and they're trying to get back into the product pattern, one of my first questions is how many users do you have and where are those users? Is it one user per client and you guys are doing a lot of the work behind the scenes? Mm -hmm. Is it five users per client? And it usually for these types of companies, it tends to be very small user bases, right? Because it's it's pretty obvious if you're building a social media company, for example, that like you're going to have to have millions of users, right? So it's pretty, it's not as easy to delude yourself. But if you do enterprise things and you do really hard things like emerging technology applications, space tech, AI tech, something for large enterprises, it's really easy to say, hey, we got this multi million dollar contract and they signed on the dotted line for something that sounds like a product, right? I don't want to make up a, a name, but it's like, you know, maybe a one or two line description that they think they're getting a data analytics system for why. Right? That sounds like a product, but it is unfortunately not. And the challenge is you just you can't expand that way because if people don't see the value directly inside their organization and they don't create their own wins, not just the wins that you created, but they don't create their own wins, mm -hmm. then you will never have a successful user adoption campaign. And if you don't have a successful user adoption campaign, eventually what will happen is you'll get to contract renewal and the contract will not renew because you know, senior enough stakeholders will basically say, okay, we're paying like $5 million a year for this thing. Who's using it? And everybody just looks around and they're like, oh, well, the, the company that sold it to us is using it. And we're producing like these interesting insights or these interesting outputs that are helping us run our business. And they'll be like, great, that sounds like a good consulting engagement. We're going to cut it by 10X, right? Or we're going to cut it entirely. And this happens every single day to companies everywhere that are on this journey. So what are those, what are the initial steps to start to make that transition? So you have, uh, I use the, my, that, that loose definition of it. So, you know, they've been, they found that pattern, something that's repeated. They've built customized solutions for a number of customers. And they say, hey, we think there's a product here. So what are the steps for that to make that transition? Yeah. I mean, the first step is that you have to have the right talent on the team and you have to have the cultural bias to do this work. And you have to have a CEO and an executive team that buys into it. And unfortunately, those first couple of things are not universal among companies that want to do this. I get asked at least once a month by a services company, can you help us build products? And then, you know, you tell them something that they need to do to be able to do that. Or like, hey, it's going to cost money up front. Um, and for example, like the, how do I put it? Like there's a mindset problem where they have gotten so deep, like in services mindset, every single engagement needs to be profitable, right? Well, and you're billable. I mean, that's the time. You're it's, billable, it's, right. It's your billable time. And so to, to go and work on something that contributes towards the product means that you, maybe not all of it, but some of it will be non-billable work. Totally. So and, you and gotta a lot of fun that, right. And so the first question you have to ask yourself is like, am I willing as a CEO of one of these companies to dedicate at least a small cell of people. I'm talking like at least two to four people, right? Anything less than that. And like, it, it truly is a joke and you're not going to achieve, you're not going to be able to build anything real 
Uh, maybe a little tool that somebody uses here and there, but like gaining revenue from that, very unlikely. Yeah. Maybe as an accelerator, but not as something that you're going to actually sell in the market. If you can't get your head around two to four people full-time, not billing to clients and building something accretive to the business, then like that's the first gut check, like you're not ready, right? So you have to be willing to make, and I know you have to be willing to make a multi-year commitment of yeah. at least that. And by the way, I'm talking about like, the tiniest possible team that could be successful. We're talking about maybe one product person, maybe a half of a designer, maybe an engineer or two or three, right? Like we were not talking about a big team. Um, so that's the first thing is, are they ready to do that? And then the second thing is there's a cultural attitude, which is, are you going to be willing to say no to sales that are related to your product, but are not actually your product. Well, let me ask you though, because I was that my next question was, because I, I know a strategy for a lot of companies is, well, we can go and do a customer, uh, uh, you know, funded product development where you give them, you've got in a special arrangement. They know they've got a V1 of this product. You've built other solutions, but you're trying to productize it. And so I've seen many companies and companies I've been in and product roles where, we gave a deep discount, but knowing that we would own the, the product that we'd be able to go and reuse that. So they were essentially funding that development activity, um, again, at a discount, but that we would end up with a product. And yeah. the problem there is kind of what you started going down is that the, the problem there is that anytime there's another, if you've not completely made that transition, every time there's a customer has an issue or their priority, which is not forwarding the productization of this service, but you have to go meet the needs of that customer, you're pulling those resources away from that dedicated project. Yeah. So and I would say, battle. I would say that it's, it's such a tantalizing option. Oh, they're going to pay for it for us. They're going to do this for us. And I think that the, the only times that I've seen that work is when there are in fact two totally separate teams working on the engagement. And this comes back to that investment. The CEO of the company has to be willing to acknowledge that even though the customer may or may not be paying for this engagement, you still need two teams. You need a team that's responsible for the individual success of the engagement because at the moment you do this work, you are still a services company. And if that engagement doesn't feel like you're being responsive to it. They are not going to give you the level of money that you think is necessary to invest in your product. And then you also have to have like side by side with that team, a product team. And effectively the services team has to be the customer of the product team in that style of an engagement. And, and they both have different roles to play, right? And, the, and it, you can think of it at its simplest level. The simplest level is that the service facing engagement team is responsible for making sure that the customer is happy and making sure that customer engagements grow. But the product team is responsible for making sure that everything that gets built for quote unquote, the product is going to work for that customer and all of the other customers that are going to adopt this thing. And that's where it usually breaks down is like that mind, that second mindset of, and it has to be useful for all of these other customers. That is usually where these things break down or that, you know, the, the team is trying to, um, you know, build this thing in the, in like using the people who are responsible for the engagement, but those people will keep getting pulled in like 20 different directions by the customer. I think like one of, like, I'll just, I'll just dispel this myth right now. Like the biggest mistake that I see from services first companies. So companies that were not founded to be venture back companies and like strayed, but ones that like were always services companies is to say the following thing that sounds so good, but it is so not going to work. And that is, well, we have some people on the bench right now. We have some people that are not currently on engagements and we'll just have them contribute to building this product. And what this completely misunderstands is two things. Number one, like Joe handing off to Larry, handing off to Susie, handing off to Steve, every time they each have five minutes, like human beings don't make progress on important goals through that sort of effort. Like that's the first thing. It's just an organizational dynamic. It's not going to work. But the second side of it is it assumes that building a product is just building the product, right? And building a product is not building a product. Half of building a product is building a product. 
The other half of it is making sure that it's valuable, it's marketing it, it's getting people to pay attention, it's customer success, it's adoption, it's sales, all of these other roles. And people unfortunately get sort of like enamored with the engineering piece of product building and say, well, I can conceptualize how someone might be able to functionally write the level of code that is required to have a product, mm -hmm. but building a product does not make a product, unfortunately. Um, and this is like one of the hardest lessons for first-time founders. By the way, I was a first-time founder at one point that made this mistake as well. And so it was really impactful for me to see firsthand what this mistake looked like, which is building a product and expecting that the world will adopt it just because it's out there. That's not how it works. It, the only people that that works for are the most famous people on the planet or a second time founder that everyone already trusts who has you know a million people on social media following them. And even those people, if I can't name names, but even those, if they're telling the truth, they will tell you the following. The truth is that if you have a million followers, and you tweet out about your new product, you will immediately get 5, 10, 15, 20,000 people to sign up for your product. But guess what happens six weeks later? That number drops down to like 100, okay? Because the initial product that you launched is not necessarily as valuable as you think it is. Most products just aren't on first launch as valuable as we'd like them to be. So there's all of this follow on work. So I would say, like, my first piece of advice would be to say, if your plan is to build this using people's off hours time from the bench, you're not ready. Yeah. Well, that's a, a interesting observation. Having worked with a number of companies that, uh, I mean, fairly common is where you have uh, maybe funded some that you, some contractors that you bring them in that are dedicated to, you know, part of that, but having uh, worked with uh, outsourced engineering companies, huge companies, both in uh, China and India, um, one thing that I noticed about both of them is that they had their, the typical, and I will say, I don't want to insult anybody, but the lower level engineers that did more of the outsourced IT function, that real time, but each of those huge organizations had uh, a, a smaller group of engineers specifically for product development. Like that, that was their specialty of working with companies to develop that intellectual property to productize that thing. And so like there, even if you don't have the bench, the, the personnel to go and do that, there are other resources, other ways that you can go and, and, and do that. Um, I know that, uh, uh, again, uh, two different people that spun that left Microsoft as senior leaders that both went and started private funds where they provide that exactly that scenario of somebody has an idea. They don't have the team. They don't have that expertise. They've built it and supported. They, they had the idea for this. How do I actually make a product that I can then take to market? Um, and so it's sometimes, but it goes back to the point you made. You still then have to fund that. You have to make that decision. Hey, we're going to go do that, carve it off. And also sometimes the harder part is to recognize that you may not have the right team or you might not be the right leader for once that's even created. Because that's another problem. A lot of people that are you know, like built in that consulting, that billable hours, that, that side of things may not be the right people then to lead a product yeah. I mean, look, an outsourced dev team that is actually good at product, and that's a big if because a lot of them are not, but for right. the ones that are good at product and they are out there, they exist, uh, That that is a good way to make sure that you have the horsepower. But like you said, if you're the founder or you're the GM that's responsible for this innovation at a bigger company, imagine the following scenario. Everything goes perfectly. You hire this company, they build everything that you want, and they deliver it to you on your doorstep tomorrow. Now what happens? Who's selling it? Who's servicing it? Who's maintaining it? Who is adding features to it? Who's doing all of these things? And it comes from, unfortunately, a misunderstanding that comes from the consulting world, which is, well, in consulting, there's a project, there's a scope of work, and then the project and the scope of work are done. And so that's why we have, you know, whenever we interface with a crufty old website for a government service, that's why we have what we have, because it was contracted 15 years ago. There was never another contract to update it. So we have to deal with this old tech. And that works in market failure settings, like the government building something where they're the only provider. Mm -hmm. But in settings where you are building products, you are competing with every last entrepreneur on planet Earth who is venture-backed who has the right team, who has the right stuff, 
who has the right knowledge and cultural outlook and who probably has more talented engineers than you. And so if you want to win in that, and I, by the way, I'm painting like a very gloomy picture here. There are totally ways to make this work. So to be very clear, what you have to do is you have to lean on the expertise that your company has. So that's what the other teams don't have. If you're the consulting firm that's already done 100 engagements on some very specialized piece of the universe, then you have this massive organizational knowledge about what customers actually need. That's a huge strength. You just have to find a way to actually tap into that to make sure your products are serving that particular need so that you can catch up on all the ways that you wouldn't be able to catch up you know, from the outset. You know, it's interesting. You talked about kind of the, the the marketing and sales aspect of that. I think this is important distinction too, is that, you know, most, uh, so having spent most of what I do, fractional CMO work with a lot of uh, startups, I've focused almost entirely on ISV. So independent software vendors building solutions. So product companies doing marketing for a product, for multiple products for these companies is just very different. And, and a lot of things that I do for ISVs does not translate over to a now a service-based business. Like, sure, you can leverage those things once they have a product and move it across. But again, it's just, it's a very different sales and marketing approach that a lot of organizations aren't prepared for that those differences and again it's 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 about what is what are the skills of your team do you have the right people for that next step and another aspect of that is um and you kind of mentioned at the beginning it was like but if you're making that transition when do you start thinking about partners channel development like us stepping back from doing any of the hooking things up of our product and hand it off entirely I have a client, a uh, former client of mine. So they've been acquired by a larger uh, venture backed company, but uh, you know, talk to them. They made the decision. They got the product to a place and they had a number of partners that they trained, worked with closely. And they just, they had an end date and closed, finished out contracts. And at that date, everybody knew like we no longer do services. Like if you need help going and it was an analytics product, it was very complex. You needed to have some level of expertise. They had their partner success, their customer success, those sides of it, but all services immediately transitioned over these trained partners, which they expanded before getting acquired. When is the right time to start thinking of that channel strategy? I mean, I think you have to be at least post product market fit before you're thinking about that. Because if you're pre-product market fit, you don't actually know if the product is going to solve the particular problem that your customers have in the market. And at that phase, it would be very dangerous to offload any of these responsibilities because, because what is effectively necessary at that stage is to continue building lots and lots of things. And it's only after you achieve product market fit where there is some degree, and I say some degree because it's not a lot, but there's some degree of pressure that is taken off because... Theoretically, at product market fit, the product that you have could not change substantially for some period of time before a competitor emerges that could eat your lunch. And so for some short period of time, and it's hard to say exactly how long that is, maybe it's 12 months, maybe it's 24 months, maybe if you're really lucky, it's two or three years. But for many companies, it may only be six months. Uh, you could theoretically not invest and nothing bad would happen initially. But the key is the initially, and what happens is the consumer, the market, and I say the consumer market, but I mean the people using the product. I don't mean consumers. It could be businesses or it could be consumers. The people consuming the product have become accustomed to the fact that product companies are delivering them updates. Product companies are delivering them more and more services. And especially with the switch over the last five to 10 years of everything becoming a subscription, you expect it, right? Like if you're continuing to pay, you expect that it's going to continue to get better. You know, currently it has an integration with this. Next month, it now has an integration with that. And so the trick is, I think this is where, where people like, this is why I say the cultural orientation is so important. People come into this game and they are not thinking about the fact that like the, the you're not, it's not like, oh, we did a good job for our company given our culture. Right. And that's what everyone wants to pat themselves on the back for. And like, look, I'm happy for you. That is an achievement. That's not an easy thing to accomplish. I'm not denigrating that. But if the goal is to win and to make lots of money from this product and then have a massive impact on the world as a result of it, 
you have to not be better than yourselves. You have to be better than everybody else that your clients could hire in the form of a product to go do this work instead. Yeah. Well, tell, uh, you know, one, uh, two, two last areas I want to cover in the time we have. Um, I, you know, I know from um, when you think about implementation and starting to scale that, I mean, measurement, looking at, you know, what, what is working, what's not working. I mean, important aspect, I mean, you just mentioned this. If you give up too much of the relationship to partners, to channel, dealing with customers, you're not going to learn as much or as quickly um, have those experiences to improve the, the products that you're building. You need to make sure that the feedback is there. But um, when you're working with companies, are there any specific um, uh, uh, KPIs or metrics that you look at of whether a company is making the, I mean, I, every, every company is different, every product is different, but um, that they're moving in the right direction at the right sure. speed. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I, there are literally hundreds of metrics and thousands of blog posts written about which metric should be your North star metric and what you should track. And I think like 95% of that is just a waste of time, right? I think that there are only two metrics that matter in product and every single one is a derivative of these two. One of them is revenue and the other one is traction. Revenue, of course, like What's the size of the deal? How much money are we making for this deal? Traction, how much are people actually using this thing? How many users? How long are the sessions? Anything that derives from the intensity of the usage of the product or the volume of usage of the product. And everything else is, is basically like a derivative of those two things. So yeah. key is you need at least one metric in each of those categories. And then you know to give everybody kind of the, the cheat book, I think there's one metric in product that is actually... The simplest metric to track that has the highest bang for the buck, and that one is percentage of users who are active. And it sounds deceptively simple, but it is actually a ratio, and it's a ratio that is expressing over time, does the percentage of people that have access to this product who are actually using it increase, stay the same, or decrease? Yeah. And what almost every product experiences is that there's a sticky anchor at whatever your initial number is. So it could be like you onboard 10 people and two of them are using the product. So, so your percentage of users who are active is 20%. Yeah. And then you release like 17 new features and you're like, oh, people wanted these. So that number should go up, right? It should become 30% or 40%. And what actually happens is it just flatlines like literally for the entire life of the product. And this is a pretty dramatic statement, but if that happens, then your entire build effort didn't amount to anything. Right. right? Yeah. Um, and so like that, that's the devil. That's that's part of the skill of product is understanding which features, which pieces of value are actually going to move the needle so that in the next release, we go from 10 users to 20 users. We don't want to have only four who are active. That's the same percentage. We want to have five or six who are active now because the product is actually superior. So that would be the one that I would track if you could only do one. You know, it, it's interesting because as a lot of large companies, Microsoft had this problem where they were so focused on the sales, the number of clients that are in there, and they've completely shifted a lot of these companies away because what, what would happen is they do these huge deals and then comes up two, three years later for renewal. And these companies were like, I'm not going to renew at that. Uh, we're only, we're seeing 10, 15% usage of that. We're like, we're not getting the value back out. And so suddenly for a lot of these companies that became hugely important. It's, you can have fewer sales, but higher engagement. I mean, that tells you a lot more, again, from a channel perspective, that tells me, hey, there's a lot more usage that there's a lot more opportunity around that. If we can have other services on top of that for the services companies. You can also fail in, yeah, you can fail in either direction, which is yeah. why I say you have to track both, right? You could have tons of revenue and no users, and you could have tons of users and unfortunately no revenue. And that's why like any product person that isn't tracking both of those or any company that isn't tracking both of them will eventually pay a very serious price for it. Yeah. Well, my last question for you is around, have to ask around future trends and innovations. I mean, obviously uh, uh, every product needs to have AI in it, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you see, what, what trends do you see for, for companies specifically that are making this transition? I mean, I mean, we, we laugh about it, but I mean, that's a very real thing. It's, it's happening across the board. And I think increasingly uh, consumers are going to, enterprises are going to ask for that, you know, how... Yeah. 
is it integrated? Is it adaptable? Is it scalable? Is it, am I able to go in and all of my users be able to go in and uh, use native language to ask it to do things and provide insights and kind of all those things? Any yeah, other yeah. trends that you're seeing? There's two things that I'll call out that are very different trends. So one of them that is sort of the more obvious trend is if you use generative AI, specifically generative AI, so chat GPT style interfaces for your own data in your own product, that is proving to be a valuable chain. Now, not everybody is going to adopt, right? Like you could, uh, you could make the AI augmented version of your product available and try to upsell. Maybe only 10% of your users are going to do that upsell, but there is more revenue to be had for now you can search all your things this way. Now you can search all your emails this way. Now you can ask customer support agent the question that you actually want to ask and get the answer. That's definitely valuable. Like I think I think that is only just starting to be tapped, and we're going to see more and more of that. Um, those are they're not all equally valuable for every user, but there's value there. Hmm. I think the second trend, which is the one that's even more exciting for me, is this idea of uh, single entrepreneur companies that have built everything using generative AI. The idea being that theoretically, we're practically at a point, it's, it takes a, a little bit of uh, gum and spit and glue to hold everything together right now, but we are practically at the point where for a modest complexity app, not a high complexity emerging tech scenario, for a modest complexity app, you can ask generative AI to write the code. You can ask different generative AI tools to test some of your value hypotheses. You can ask different tools to actually design the product for you. And if you know how to bring all of those particular pieces together, then you can do something really exciting and fancy. And so one of the things that we're starting to do at First Principles is we are building some AI-first driven product management teams mm -hmm. where they are led by a super talented product leader who thinks in terms of how can we get the computer to do as much of this work for us as possible. There's an interesting conversation to be had around uh, security and intellectual property management when you're leveraging public tools. So being knowing enough about that, and leveraging and making sure that that process is more secure than just a consumer going out and using something like always be careful using consumer grade products to do uh, I build IP for your company folks. For sure. For sure. There's a lot of offline models that you can use now. You just have to know where to find right. them and how to right. use them. Um, at the same time, like I personally don't share the same skepticism. I think that most of these companies are so busy shipping their own product and their, their intellectual property rights are written in a way where they're not trying to say that we own your product. They're just saying like, we want to be able to see what you asked to improve our product. So I think, I think it will be a long time in the future before somebody prompts chat GPT and then gets sued by chat GPT to own a percentage of their company. So personally, I think it's a little overblown, but at the same time, like it depends on the use case, right? If it's something super sensitive, like drug discovery or national security or something like that, you should take the extra time to use an offline model. I, I know that the, uh, the again, I, IP creation and the patent process that needs to be completely overhauled and kind of everything else around that, you're right. I mean, there's, and there's a certain strategy to being innovating quickly, leveraging the tools that are out there and being first to market. There is a lot of value there, um, even if you don't have some of those traditional protections in place. But again, that's a whole other discussion, but really appreciate your time. Uh, I, it's been great to have discussion. So Adam, for folks that want to, connect with you, reach out. Where can people find you? Where are you most active in social? Yeah, I'm most active in two places. One is www.emergentproduct.com. That's my newsletter. That's where my podcast is. That's where all the great content lives. Um, and then I also post pretty aggressively on LinkedIn, just Adam Juddelson uh, on LinkedIn. And you can follow me and, and see my latest insights. I post uh, almost every day. So would love of course to have I'll you follow. Have I'll have links to both in the blog and out on YouTube. So really appreciate your time. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.